We don't have an awful lot of portraiture for us to use in terms of recreating the face of Nama, but I think what we have is enough and that's what made this reconstruction really interesting. I mean, I, I need you to stay tuned for this because it's a really interesting reconstruction and it's one of my, it's one of my most enjoyable uh, and you've got to see why. What's going on people? Welcome to the King's Monologue, the place where we challenge Eurocentric norms and establish the African and melanated contributions to world history. Thank you for joining me. Now I know it's been a little while since I did my last video and I can't make any excuses other than the fact that I've been working really hard to basically get content organized, to put out a new series, the live stream, if you called it live, took a lot of energy out of me I'm not going to lie there's a lot to live stream and I have a massive new respect for people who do live streams now because it really is not the easiest thing to do but yep thank you for joining me on the channel today we're going to be doing another reconstruction and that reconstruction is going to be of the first pharaoh or Nezwut of Kemet and that is pharaoh Nama Now, when it comes to Pharaoh Nama, he has a very interesting history in regards to whether or not Nama and Minas were two separate people. That was something that was believed previously, but later on it came to be accepted that Nama and Menes were the same person, and Menes was just a title, an honorific that was given to certain rulers. So it was given to Nama, and it was actually given to the Pharaoh who ruled after him. It means he who endures. And it was basically a title that was given to the person or the Pharaoh or the king the ruler that was responsible for the unification and it seems that the unification of Keme was not something done under a single ruler it was actually something that was a kind of sustained effort over a period of time that seemed to span from the pre-dynastic Kemet right up into you know the middle of the first dynasty let's talk about the likeness of Nama because really that's why we're here we don't have an awful lot of portraiture for us to use in terms of recreating the face of Nama but I think what we have is enough and that's what made this reconstruction really interesting I mean I, I need you to stay tuned for this because it's a really interesting reconstruction and it's one of my it's one of my most enjoyable uh, and you've got to see why now first of all when it comes to likenesses of Nama what do we have we don't have a lot essentially we have two sources. We have the Nama palette, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, and I will go through um, in some detail during this video. And we also have the bust of Nama. Now, the bust of Nama is a pretty miniature bust. It's not very large, and it was found. I'm going to say found in inverted commas by Flinders Petrie. Um, Petrie is one of the first and most well-known Egyptologists. He was also a very ardent racist <laughs> very much of the darwinian ideology so he had no reason first of all to attribute any kind of credit to anything that he esteemed or viewed to be black african indigenous negroid he thought all of these people were beneath him based on his writings based on his findings however he thought that the bust of Nama definitely was the bust of Nama. Now, what difficulties do we have? First of all, there's no cartouche. We have nothing to kind of ascribe or say that this is or isn't Nama. So the question mark then is raised. Then why do we classify that this is Nama? What evidence do we have that supports it's Nama? Now, I'm going to put my hat in the ring. I'm going to say that I do believe it's Nama and I'm going to kind of give you my evidence as to why I believe it to be Nama. All we know is that he purchased the bust from somewhere in Egypt. Maybe he was privy to more information than what he's actually allowed the general public to know about this bust for him to be so certain that it was Nama. But I actually believe it was Nama and I'm going to tell you why. The two likenesses of Nama that we know are Nama are on the Nama palette. And if you look, the Nama palette has two sides. It's one side which shows him in the crown of Upper Egypt and it has another side which shows him in the crown of Lower Egypt. And, you know, reading the works of Diop and other historians, it's clear to me, at least from from their works and from my own understanding, that the Nama palette shows the activities of what took place in Upper Egypt and what took place in Lower Egypt. 
Now, we know from the writings of Manefo that Nama was from Upper Egypt. So he's not someone who came in to invade Upper Egypt. Upper Kemet is where he was from. Now, Lower Kemet was the place he was bringing into unification. So he already was. He came in as the king of Upper Kemet from what we can see. I've got an interpretation of the Nama palette based on various findings. Once again, this is opinion. All of these are going to be theory and people have different theories about how to interpret the Nama palette. So take everything that I say with a pinch of salt because we actually have very little written text when it comes to what was actually taking place on the Nama palette. So I'm going to share with you what my interpretation is. So on the one side, we have him with the crown of Upper Egypt. And this side is essentially telling us about the activities that took place within Upper Egypt or Upper Kemet, I should say. Nama wears the crown of Upper Egypt and you can see this side of the Nama palette seems to be about subjugation. It seems to be about the controlling of a population, maybe some kind of internal conflict. Now, Nama is clearly bringing people of that land of Upper Egypt under subjugation so maybe this could be some internal political turmoil now the one thing to note is phenotypically that the people on this side to me look like egyptians they look like how the kemetic people portrayed themselves we have first of all nama's attendants who all have afros or they're bald and then you have the people being brought under subjugation which appear to be where in a variation of the Egyptian twist which we've covered it's a layered hairstyle it's you can see it here um, that looks like a, that for my kind of observation that looks like a deliberate hairstyle and you can see with the facial features that to me these are clearly African people on this side of the Nama palette now if you flip over to the other side of the Nama palette this is the activities that took place in Lower Kemet now these activities are very different um, in the top, the very top third, I should say, shows you the people who have been, you know, executed um, as a part of the war that has taken place. And then in the middle, you have the the separapods. Now, the interpretation of this has been essentially this: these were to show the unification of the two lands. Now, I have a different theory, and I think personally, my theory holds a bit more weight. But at the same time. You know, I'm not an Egyptologist, I'm just a theorist, but if someone would say that we're all theorists in that regard. But I think it makes more sense in the context that this side of the Nama palette is shown activities that took place in Lower Kemet. So if you've seen my other video on maps, you'll already know, spoiler alert, what my interpretation of this side of the Nama palette is. This part, portion of the Nama palette, I should say, shows to me the interpretation of the Nile's role in Kemet. Essentially, the two bodies represent the two great lakes. And by the way, this interpretation comes from a map that I saw. Now, obviously, it wasn't a contemporaneous map. And one of the things we need to note is that it's a 15th century map that we're looking at. So this isn't by any means an exact or precise map of obviously what Africa looked like. But bearing in mind that the information that they would have had would have been limited and also bear in mind the technology that was available they wouldn't have had the same things we have available now such as you know um, balloons or satellites or any other kind of high altitude pictorial technology everything would, would have been done based on information that was being passed from one person to the other and this is where the concept of using personification and metaphor as a means of creating maps would come into play and the thing that i note instantly here is that there's clearly a similarity between what i can see on the nama palette and what i can see on this map perhaps this personifications and parables were always the method of communication much of the Kemetic religion was based on personification i.e understanding scientific principles by relating it to metaphor relating it to the human body relating it to the human experience and relating it to things that we observe on a daily basis in order for us to basically understand how these things apply in nature so that we're able to then tell that story and I believe that this would have been how they communicated the Nile 
river would run through Africa. So the two bodies of the sepropods represent the two great lakes. The limbs, they each have five limbs, and I believe this is done deliberately to show the amount of branches each of those great lakes have. Now, one of the things we have to bear in mind is the change in topography of Africa. One of the things I've uncovered quite a lot in my research over time is the the way the lakes and the rivers have changed shape in Africa is actually quite significant. So we can't take for granted that what we look at now, for instance, on Google Maps or what we look at now on kind of different mapping technologies is the same as what the ancients would have been um, confronted with in terms of their waterways. Um, these waterways change path for several reasons. It can be a climactic issue, i.e., you know, the climate changes and, you know, certain waterways will swell or dry. Um, there's also the issue of man made intervention, things like damming in order to kind of like affect the flow of the rivers and to build, vi you know, villages and um, ecosystems around river systems. So, Many of these rivers would have changed shape, but one of the things that I noticed is the, and I'm going to kind of point out to be quite significant, is that when I look at this um, map, it's the two lakes that are furthest south that seem to obey this kind of image of being the bodies of animals or bodies of separate parts. So these are the, the two significant lakes. So if you was to compare that to modern maps, it could be a depiction of, you know, Lake Molawi and Lake Tanganyika. All of this is speculation. We don't know what these two great lakes represent. We know it's somewhere south. We know it's in and around that kind of Uganda, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, Burundi region. And we know that somewhere in and around that region is where these two great lakes would have originated. Um, exactly which lakes they were that part we don't know so we have the two great lakes that essentially provide the source for the waters of the Niles now then we have two extremely long necks and these necks don't have any form of explanation if you look at Egyptologists um theorizations and interpretations of what the Nama palette is however in my interpretation the long neck has a perfectly logical explanation and that is these long necks represent the Nile River or the two sources intertwining and becoming entangled with one another to form a single river. Now bear in mind that we're talking about the fact that this side of the Nama palette is showing activities in Lower Kemet so why is it significant to this side? Well that's where the very head of this comes in. What we note here is that the two heads are facing each other and you can see there's clear hostility in the faces of the actual separate parts themselves and they're being manually restrained from basically attacking one another or at least you know being quite hostile and they are being manually restrained by the Kemetic people so what does this represent well if we continue the whole analogy of the bodies representing the Great Lakes and the necks representing the Nile River then the heads would represent the Delta region and I believe the ferocity and hostility being shown in the faces of these um, two separate parts represents that where the Nile parts is an area of great ferocity. I believe this is shown or this depiction is made to show the ongoing hostility between the Mediterranean civilizations and the constant restraining that the Kemetic people will need to do in order to maintain the land. So you have these two Kemetic people, they're restraining this hostile head from essentially consuming itself. And I believe that that is a depiction of the conflict, the constant conflict, which has the Kemetic people in a position of constant restraint. Now, I haven't just picked this definition out of the sky. I believe this is supported if we look to the bottom of the lower side of the Nama palette. I call it the lower side because it represents Lower Kemet. If we look at the bottom, we have this clearly Levantine man. Um, he's clearly a kind of Eurasian or Asiatic man. You can see it's in his depiction. He has a completely different phenotype to the Egyptians or the Kemetic people who are on the other side. And to me, if you look at the kind of phenotype in the face of this man who's being trampled underfoot, he does look like an Asiatic. I think there's this is very common with the portrayal of Asiatics in Kemetic artwork. You always see them with these long 
aquiline hook noses that are very distinctive and very different from the phenotype that would be shown on the, the upper chemist side of the Nama palette. So there's a clear distinction here. So these people are being trampled underfoot or kept at bay. Now, they are being trampled under the feet of a bull and I, the bull has always been a representation of the pharaoh but also the bull is a representation and you can see the bull iconography all over the Nama palette and the bull is a representation of the fact that ancient Egyptian society itself was a Taurian society so this is something that isn't spoken about a lot either is the fact that during the time of ancient Kemet's heights we were in the equinox of Taurus now after the equinox of Taurus came the equinox of Aries now Aries is the representation of the sheep or the goats is the representation of the shepherd and that's when the shepherd people had their rise so actually the birth of the the the, the um, Israelites and the birth of the kind of like Abrahamic faiths was also the birth of Aries the shepherding equinox and I believe that played a massive part in regards to the iconography that you see throughout the Bible. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. The, the people of um, Moses are regarded as sheep. Moses broke the tablets over the bull representing the Taurian or the belief in Taurus. The end of the Taurus faith for the people of Israel um, because they were supposed to be following the shepherding faith at that point. So there's a lot of astrology that's intertwined in a lot of ancient religions and i believe that obviously we know that hathor also was the um goddess who's represented with bull horns but these aren't when you look at the nama palette these bulls aren't representative of hathor i don't believe there's no kind of like nothing to suggest that these are kind of like representations of hathor um to me this is representations of the fact that they they are a taurian faith and the bull is very much the the icon um, of preference for the people of Kemet and also it's very important to note that the word Aryan that pe a lot of people associate with being white you know or kind of like oh you know the proud Aryans the blonde haired the whites that's that's not the origin of the term Aryan the term Aryan comes from being a follower of Aries the first Aryans would have been the Israelites and we know that the Israelites um, certainly were not white with blonde hair um, so it's something that, that a term that was co-opted by people who became racist you know maybe a few hundred years ago but before then the term Aryan simply meant follower of Aries um, just like the term Taurian meant follower of Tories and then you had Piscians who came afterwards those were the followers of you know the the Christ faiths so to speak and they were Piscians hence you have the or the fish iconography that take that came um, after the birth of Christ and, and the, the birth of that Christian Christianity religion now all of that goes into rather um, um, very very much grey area so I don't want to dive into too much detail into all of that but I just want to give you kind of my interpretation of the Nama palette there's definitely a, a wider conversation we could have about the way the Nama palette applies to all of our thoughts but I want to now focus in on the representations of Nama that we have on the Nama palettes now why do I think that the bust that was found by Flinders Petrie is the same person that's on the Nama palette. Well, there's a very distinctive physical feature. Now, bear in mind, I spent a majority of my time looking at kinetic artwork, literally. Um, I am very complimentary, and I don't hide the fact that I'm very complimentary of kinetic artists. I think they are some of the best in history and some of the most realistic as well. And I think a lot of the dialogue behind trying, you know, essentially euphemizing and simplifying the work of the Egyptian Kemetic artisans is the fact that their artwork just looks too African and I think that's the case here the reason there's been controversy about whether or not this actually is a depiction of Nama is because it's clearly the depiction of someone who is you know of an African stock and I'm going to tell you which stock that I believe them to be as well so why do I think that this is the same depiction well there is a very consistent feature you can see here and the consistent feature becomes much more clear if you can if you have a look at this profile view of the bust now hopefully looking at its profile view you can see what that consistent feature is and that is there's a continuation from the top of the forehead to the tip of the nose Nama has a very 
pronounced nose bridge. It's so pronounced, in fact, that it literally runs from the tip of his forehead to the tip of his nose. There's almost no indentation. Now, this isn't an unknown. This isn't an unknown characteristic. This is something that does occur. And I'm going to tell you which ethnicity you tend to see this in. But this is something that I noticed straight away. And it's something that is consistent with both of his depictions on the Nama palette. So if we look at him on the lower Kemet side and we look at him on the upper Kemet side of the Nama palette, Nama's face is distinctive. It's distinctive from the upper Egyptians. It's distinctive even from the standard bearers and the other Kemetic people. They all have kind of more standard looking African features, whereas Nama has this very pronounced bridge. So this is deliberate. These are artists honoring what Nama looks like. And this is something that also is not seen very often. In fact, it's very rare. I can't think of another ruler that has such a distinctive, you know, nose bridge and brow as Nama does that's depicted in either stele art or on statues. So there definitely was an appreciation of his face. And that was enough for me to say this is a depiction of the same person. They don't do or make mistakes like that, something so substantial that's beyond a coincidence to me. So when I looked at that feature, I instantly said, OK, now I need to know which African ethnicity or where do we see these features? Because he has quite distinctive features. He has these lips that are, you know, prominent, but not full. They're not massive lips. And then he has this very, very prominent and quite a broad nose, you know, an undeniably broad nose. So where do we see this? And straight away, it, it rang loud and clear. This is a Southern African trait. In particular, something that you'll see amongst the Khoisan people and something you'll see amongst the Nguni slash Zosa people. So this is a very distinctive trait to those peoples. So I started looking through pictures of Khoisan people, San people, Zosa people. And by the way, one thing to make clear as well, there is this kind of like idea that the Nguni people, i.e. the Zulu, the Zosa, um, versus the San people. There are many people who are have got very strict kind of, you know, quote unquote, you know, Zulu phenotype. And then you have people who have quite strict San phenotype. But then you've just got this whole melee of phenotypes in between. Um, and those two, you know, those kind of distinct ethnic groups have obviously mixed because they possess very, very unique phenotypes to that region of the planet. OK, so you have these Southern African phenotypes. But also, if you look amongst the sand people, looking at that nose bridge as well, not just the broadness of the nose, but that nose bridge connection where you have that straight line running down from the top of the forehead down to the tip of the nose. I've seen that quite a lot in the, you know, the Khoisan populations. And um, it's a, a trait that I've seen kind of running into the Zosa people as well. So it became a lot easier for me to then, when once I look at these people, I was like, there it is. That is, I can see the face of Nama fitting in these populations. What I found out actually afterwards, which was quite interesting, is that, some recent genetic tests have related the Khoisan people with the earliest um, inhabitants of Egypt um, via DNA testing. Now, these are kind of haplotype based DNA tests, which I don't place a huge amount of credence on. But I think that connection has certainly been made. So that just only adds more credence. And obviously, the, you know, the DNA tribes 2014 um, DNA study linked, the, you know, ancient Egyptians were Southern Africans closer or more than any other uh, group on the African continent, which was very interesting to see as well. So the Zosa people certainly came out loud and clear when I looked at the bust of Nama. So then that became my basis. And from there, I would say it was pretty straightforward to then develop what Nama's face looked like in complete obedience of the bust. So without any further ado, this is my reconstruction of Pharaoh Nama.
complexion wise I've tried to be as honest towards the San slash Zosa complexion as possible it's a it's a lighter skinned complexion and to me that just fits just right this is an indigenous African complexion and you can see it's got kind of got that yellowy undertone that you get with the Khoisan people and I was happy with that because I think that's what you can see here this is the complexion that certainly fits right facially this is the the face of a man of war <laughs> this easily is the most brutal and warlike reconstruction that I've done when I've done reconstructions recently such as my Josa reconstruction my Tutankhamen reconstructions my Akhenaten reconstructions people always talk about how pretty and good looking they are <laughs> you know these are really good looking reconstructions this one I don't think I'll get that same reaction this is certainly a man of war but when I created it I was like that has to be the face of Nama this is this is the face of a of a ruler who was there to do a job in my opinion you know he was there to unify the two lands he went there to mess about and I just look at this face and I was like this looks right the minute you know he didn't have the kind of the softness that the face of Akhenaten had and if you look at the, the softness of the face of Akhenaten that does very much match his character he was all about kind of, he was like you know you're the closest thing that you'll get to a hippie in, in in the you know in the ancient times you know he was very much about peace and love but that wasn't Nama's that wasn't Nama's shtick <laughs> Nama was very much about conquest about war about the unification he was there to do a job and essentially this reconstruction seems to communicate that really well to me so I, I was all in all very very happy uh, everything f for me in terms of this reconstruction seemed to land in the correct place the facial features as you can see are perfect once again you know my approach I don't try to fit a narrative i.e these features fit exactly as what I'm presented with I don't make anything larger I don't make anything smaller I don't exaggerate features and I certainly I'm not there to push a certain phenotype on you this is just what fits if you can find a human ethnicity that exists that can fit this bust better then that's my challenge to you because sometimes obviously I know this has come from my amazing community but obviously the criticisms I get from ridiculous people um, who are either Eurocentric or you know who are you know people Egyptians who feel that I am stealing their history or you know Arabs who want to claim Egyptian history that's the first criticism you'll get oh well, why have you chosen this script this um, complexion or why are you trying to make them look West African it's like oh I'm not actually I've only got one of only one of my reconstructions I would say even looks West African and that would be the the um, Josa bust and I would say well that's because all of Josa's statues and <laughs> stele artworks you know match that description so don't blame me blame them my challenge to you is if you can make something fit better in terms of a reconstruction of Nama that actually looks like him and doesn't look like the ridiculous reconstructions of Nama that have totally ignored all of his likenesses then by all means do so but this is a reconstruction that honors his likenesses honors the statue to a T and if you're able to do that without distorting features for another population then by all means I challenge you to do it so that's it that's the end of this video um, I know it's been a little bit of a longer video um, than I probably had originally anticipated but I hope the information has been informative please do hit on that like button if you're not subscribed you know what to do please do subscribe I've got another reconstruction coming out very very soon um, it might even be coming out tomorrow because um, I want to put out a few reconstructions back to back from various historians and I think it's quite clear it's been a little while since I've done a reconstruction now I was kind of pondering to myself why this is the case because I do the reconstructions regardless of whether or not I'm putting them out I'm constantly producing them so I actually have a backlog of reconstruction videos to do now obviously reconstructions were the first and the original content that I used to put out on the channel that essentially got me this entire audience that I have now so why haven't I been so committed to putting out reconstruction videos I had to ask myself that question I think some of it boils down to although reconstructions are 
really important and to me they they are almost my priority to create them and to put them out uh, my reconstruction videos garner the least views now that's not to say that the reconstruction content is not something that people want to see it's more of a case of maybe my video format isn't the best or maybe it needs revision or maybe i need to think about the way i approach the reconstruction videos so really that's the question i'm currently pondering do i carry on with the long video format or do i maybe just create a new short format for each of my reconstructions maybe that will be a little bit more engaging and maybe people don't need the the whole dialogue behind how it was created what process i took to create it i'm just pondering these things so obviously on that note if you think you have the answer to that question or you have some suggestions about how i can make the reconstruction videos a bit more engaging a bit more shareable and maybe help them to get a bit more views because many of them sit under 10k views and i think you know i've got over 40,000 subscribers so that means not even all of the subscribers on the channel have checked out things like my Nefertiti reconstruction my Akhenaten reconstruction my King Joseph reconstruction I'm sure they've probably seen the reconstructions and in that regard probably don't see the need to go and watch the full length video so this is what I'm pondering at the moment help me out community uh, I just want to know that I'm putting out the best content all the time and also it's informative and it's worthwhile and it's valuable so that's basically what I've been kind of like trying to figure out but anyway I really appreciate everyone in the community please do support me on patreon um, it gives me more ability to be able to produce more content um, at the moment I am somewhat restricted in terms of how much I want to put out and how much time I'm able to commit to this so um, you know if you want to see more of that please do support me on Patreon also on the top tier of my Patreon I do if you want some of these images in print I offer to my top tier patrons a service where I send them out on a monthly basis a new print so you, you know you could be you know support me on Patreon and but you know by the end of a you know a few months you can have an excellent collection of reconstructions and high resolution high quality prints that you could uh, place all over your wall so that's just another option there and obviously i've got some merchandise as well that you're more than welcome to purchase if you like it so that's it thank you for joining me on the king's monologue and i will see you on the next one <laughs>